Hey everybody, it is Cheese Whiz Gina here, and I am with Robbie my G. colleague, friend Robbie G. <laughs> the professor. <laughs> professor McCheese, uh, Robbie Graff, and uh, all things educational and extraordinary at Benissimo and the Academy of Cheese. Welcome to our second virtual tasting event. Um, really excited if you've come back and really excited that you're here today. Um, we're going to do these virtual events every week because we think it's quite fun and we think it's delicious and it's a way to, for us to all keep in touch. I will be taking comments if you want to ask questions as we go because Rob's going to do a lot of the speaking today and I'm going to do a lot of the eating and drinking. <laughs> and, um, but we're just happy that you're joining us. I really appreciate it. If you missed the virtual tasting number one, that was beer and cheese. It's on our YouTube channel. You can watch that anytime. And you can pick up the cheeses that we uh, offered anytime here at Finissimo by giving us a call. So today, Rob, we decided we needed to do, since we did beer last week, we're going to do red wine versus white wine. That's Which correct. is better? Why? Why not? And you're going to fill us in and tell us, right? Yes. Well, I'll attempt. I'll say there is no such thing as better or worse. It's whatever your favorite is. So I would say your favorite is the best for you. Um, we just decided to kind of go um, uh, be more general and say reds and whites. We did pick a couple specific uh, pairings for today. So we did pick a Sauv Blanc from Chile. It's just quartz, and they were available at the shop. But really, um, the varietal we picked was Sauv Blanc, and uh, we, we wanted people to feel free to use what was ever uh, in their wine cellar, or just at really any white would, would do. Uh, the red that we chose was a Nebbiolo. It's not that bottle, I don't think, is no, it? No, <laughs> this is a Petite raw. We're fooling with you. But why we're doing this, we're sticking with um, wines that are fruity, yep. um, like the Nebbiolo. And Rob's going to get into more on the whole why we picked an Italian one when yep. we get through the tastings. But if I can just jump in on just the kind of one a general rule of thumb with red wine and white wine. If you're going to a dinner party, you know they're going to have cheese or you're serving cheese. What can I make sure is going to go pretty good? Sauvignon Blanc, right? Yep. This is why we picked Sauv Blanc. That is truly one that just is crisp, great, goes with so many cheeses mm -hmm. for so many reasons. So that's why we picked that. We went with the Nebbiolo for the reason of Italy today and for the reason that it's really bright and fruity. So Nebbiolo, Pinot Noir, always a good option. Yep. I would say if, if you're going to just pick one varietal of all of them out there, you're going to be safe with Sauv Blanc and Pinot Noir. Yeah, Sauv Blanc, just a couple kind of general notes about Sauv Blanc or what I've noticed. Uh, Sauv Blanc, they tend to be really dry, but fruity, high acidity, really aromatic. And depending on where they come from, there's a few hot spots for Sauv Blanc. Um, Chile, they tend to be like the mildest, and that's the one that we had in the shop. And then you get into the kind of more medium bodied ones, which are um, grown in Bordeaux and the Loire Valley. We'll talk a lot about the Loire Valley today. Um, and then you get into the bigger ones from California and New Zealand. One of the signature notes for Sauvignon Blanc is gooseberry. So people say gooseberry a lot. Uh, and then when you get into the really strong ones, like the ones from New Zealand, the, strong, the strongest ones, you hear terms like cat pee, and you hear the weirdest, no. the weirdest. Is that be good? <laughs> is, that a, is that a cat pee somewhere? <laughs> when you, um, sometimes the descriptors on cheese and wine and, and beer are just ridiculous, uh, but it's, it's kind of funny. And some of the terms that you hear in other places would be, uh, pejorative are actually complimentary in the cheese shop. Pejorative? <laughs> Sorry. That's a word? Uh, yes, yeah, so you can look it up. Pejorative. <laughs> <laughs> San Diego State Education. <laughs> so we've got um, the Sauvignon Blanc and then we're going to work into the Nebbiolo. I would suggest opening both your red and your white now and, and pouring and kind of playing around. We are going to try to taste in order. We've got four cheeses. If you've got the, the plate, um, you have four cheeses in front of you and we'll walk you through them. Gina, did you want to eat the cheeses as we went? Well, duh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we picked, um, so we picked a couple French cheeses, a couple classic Frenchies, and a couple classic Italian cheeses. And then for some of them, we did sub, and we'll talk about uh, that as well. Um, so getting into the um, to the first pairing, we're going to start with the white. Um, the, it's usually better to go from mild to wild and start with white, and then work your way into red. Um, you just it's you want to start with the, the milder wine, the milder cheese, otherwise your palate can kind of be shot. If you if you want to start white or start red and then go into the white, that's okay too. Just give yourself a couple minutes, have a piece of bread, have a cracker, have a piece of fruit, take a walk, do whatever. Um, there's no rush, there's no right or wrong. I always want to stress that, no right or wrong. Can I say first too, for everyone out there, let's raise a glass together, a virtual toast to the times 
We're having a good time. Hope you are too. Yes. Let's begin. Cheers. Cheers. I'm more of a coffee guy myself. Yeah, yeah, it's good. <laughs> also goes good with cheese. That's a whole other episode. <laughs> um, I, on, on that note, I just want to say, and I want, I want to encourage everybody to, to stay home as much as you can um, and be healthy, be well. And uh, while fancy cheese may not be the most essential thing, what is essential is human connection and community. And that's really what we're going for these days here in Benissimo. So from our cheesy family to yours, we just want to want to tell you to, to be well, stay well, keep your head up, and uh, we'll be here striving with you. We'll, we'll come out of this together. We will. Um, so we've got four cheeses. There's a couple French cheeses and a couple of Italian cheeses. The first cheese we're going to talk about is one that is really supposed to be paired with the Sauv, the Sauvignon Blanc, and that is Seltzer Share. Should I pick it up? Yep. I'll eat it. Okay. <laughs> You're, or the Bermuda Triangle. This is the Seltzer Share, and if, um, if we... If you don't have the Seltzer Share, you have something called Bermuda Triangle. You may even have a Humboldt Fog, which is really the same thing as Bermuda Triangle, but just a different shape. And we'll talk about all that in a moment, but it should be pretty uh, clear which cheese you are eating now. Um, look for the one with the ash rind on it. Um, so a couple words about Seltzer Share and Gina's holding a little piece there. Um, in the Bermuda Triangle and Humboldt Fog are really American versions of this French cheese from the Loire Valley. Um, so it's, it is 100% goat's milk, and the word chev, if you ever see the word chev in the cheese case or hear somebody say the word chev, it just refers to goat's milk. Uh, the, it means goat uh, in French, and so chevs are goat's milk cheeses 100% of the time. Um, the Loire Valley has, I think, five protected goat's milk cheeses, and three or four of them have an, uh, a rind of, that is made of ash. And uh, for Seltzer Share, the traditional Seltzer Share, they make the ash with a uh, birch bark. That's what it was done with uh, historically. And that was a way to protect the interior or the paste of the cheese as the cheese aged. Um, it does grow some mold on the rind as it ages for 10 days to, to 25 days or so. Um, and then it gets sent out to retailers like Benissimo. And so the one we have is probably a couple months old, I would say. Um, so it's, uh, they tend to be really tangy, kind of uh, acidic, citrusy, um, and they do really well with Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I mentioned the cheeses from the Loire Valley. If you, if you tuned into our last pairing, I talked about regional pairings, and that's where we pair a cheese with a wine that are from the same region. Uh, there is a place in the Loire Valley called Sancerre, and uh, Sancerre is the name of the town. Um, and you'll, a lot of times, um, Europeans, European wines will just say the name of the place on the wine, and they assume you know what grape comes from there. If you see a Sancerre, it's usually a Sauvignon Blanc, um, and it will pair, rest assured, it will, it will pair very nicely with a cheese like the Seltzer Share. Mm -hmm. Another fun thing with the old world uh, cheeses and wines is that they're oftentimes named after their town, village, region. Um, Seltzer Share is the name of a town. It's like 200. And, 20 miles, or sorry, kilometers, I use kilometers. It's about 220 kilometers southwest of Paris, just to give you an idea of where it is. It's, it's almost smack dab in the middle of the country, actually. Um, but there's, uh, I think, like I said, four other cheeses protected by the AOC system in France. And that, mean, that stands for Appellation d'Origine Controle. Fancy. Very French. <laughs> but in San Diego, what, you know what it stands for? No. <laughs> you came up with this. It stands for the Academy of Cheese. Oh, yes! <laughs> Imagine that, the Academy of Cheese. <laughs> and that's what we do here at Benissimo. Um, so some of the other ones, Valence, um, San Mar de Terrain, other cheeses from the Loire Valley to look out for if you can't find Seltzer Share. Um, and what's really cool is that a lot of the American, when you hear American cheese, I always say this, don't think of craft singles. Um, great cheeses made all over the United States, and one of the hot spots for cheese in the United States is Northern California. So our little Bermuda Triangle, mm -hmm. or Humboldt Fog, right? Yeah, yeah. so the cheesemaker uh, from Cypress Grove, her name's Mary Keene, she started making cheese in the early 80s, and she actually went to the Loire Valley to learn techniques and, and uh, mastered her, her, her cheese making up in uh, Northern California, and she would originally just make it for her family, and uh, she, her signature cheese is a cheese called Humble Fog, which put her on the map. It's one that we still yeah. carry. It's an iconic California cheese. Um, she actually uses, there's a line of ash that goes around the outside of the cheese, 
and then there's a line of acid that goes through the middle of the cheese, and that represents morning milk and afternoon milk. I wish I had one, we sold out of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We've actually been pretty busy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it also, if you look at the cheese kind of cut in half, it resembles a foggy horizon in Northern California. So it's, it's made like four hours north of San Francisco on the coast there. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, and this is her Bermuda Triangle. So notice like the kind of cool, fun names of the American cheeses, Bermuda Triangle. They, yeah. have, they have one called Purple Haze. Yes, which has exactly. Lavender. Psychedelic. Psychedelic with dill. Yeah. Sergeant it's, Pepper. Right. Isn't that interesting? Like the chefs and the cheeses from France, like you're talking about. Name for they the places. Name for the places. Yep. But in America, we name for marketing purposes. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it works. There's some really yeah. great, great cheeses. And right? same or thing with beer. Same thing with a lot of our wines as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the first pairing. First, can I, if I can tune in yes, a couple please. things. So some of you on your plates, you might have got this seltzer share um, with the ash on it, and it might have been uber runny. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us, Rob, when it's super runny like that? It means it's very ripe. So it's it's um it's it's hit the max for for ripeness and then it'll actually go back to being firm again after it gets runny for a little bit sometimes and it'll kind of shrink as well. That's weird science. Yeah, it is very strange. <laughs> but, and what about the Bermuda Triangle with the edge there? The... Yeah, this is a fun one and mm -hmm. Hubble Fog does this as well. Um, but you get three really different textures there. This one will ripen from the outside in. So you have the rind on the outside. Yes, you can eat it. Then you have the kind of riper part. Um, towards the the outer towards the rind and then the interior is that kind of chalky white crumbly center it'll be a little bit more mild and, and sour and tangy what that that's the type of goat cheese that I grew up um, eating and, and understanding was that kind of crumbly goat cheese that went into the, the beet salad that exactly mom made. Yeah. Right, right. very fresh very springy yeah yeah very nice so Bermuda so it was Bermuda Triangle Humboldt Fog um, I was going to think of some other good examples. Anything that's called a chev is, is going to be a good Here one go. for Sauvignon Blanc. And always good with Sauvignon Blanc. And yes. also, I should also mention, just because it's goat cheese doesn't mean it's soft. So we're, we're talking about a certain type of goat cheese, which are the softies. Um, but there are lots of goat goudas and, and other aged goat cheeses that are hard, um, like this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that leads us into our next one. Ooh, very next. What do we got? The next cheese is called Comte. This is a small little piece of it. This is a bigger piece of it. How big is the whole wheel? Well, so the whole wheel of a Comte is about 80 pounds, um, and they can be a lot bigger than that even. Nice. This is the size of a seltzer share. This is not seltzer share, but this, I grabbed this just to give you an idea of size. So a, a, wheel, a small wheel of seltzer share will weigh four ounces, five ounces or so. A whole wheel of Comte will weigh about 80 pounds. How much How much milk goes into one seltzer share, you ask? I do ask. <laughs> <laughs> about a third of a gallon, so it's like 1.3 liters. How many um, How many gallons of milk go into a wheel of Comte, which is 80 pounds? Okay, wait. So you're talking <laughs> about the gallon of milk like you put on your yes. kitchen counter? Yes, like the gallon of milk okay. that you buy at the grocery store. How many goes into this wheel and it's 80 pounds? Yeah, this is just a tiny piece of the wheel, but an eight, a whole wheel of mm -hmm. Comte, okay. how many gallons of milk? Anyone venture a guess out there? <laughs> First few person that guesses and sends me a guess, we're going to come back to this, gets a Venissimo cheese cleaver. And we'll connect somehow to get it to you, but if you ask and guess, you get the cleaver. Can I give a hint? Mm, okay. Yes, it's not really to help that much. <laughs> um, it's about the daily yield of 30 cows. Maybe okay. we'll help. <laughs> For the farmers out there. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> oh, that would be three flakes, oh, I think. Can I say Rudy? Rudy, wherever you are, uh -huh. I've got you listed. You gave a guess of three. Three gallons. I guess so. Okay. But Rudy's in there. Or three gallons. Then we've got John Berger gets a guest of 30 okay. gallons. Gotcha. Okay. So, no you know, no. both of you are getting a cleaver. Yeah. For making okay. a guess. <laughs> this is a participation. And you know, Martin, award. one more. Three cleavers, <laughs> done. Sold. I'm, I'm out at three. But <laughs> all three of you, I've got you down for cleavers. Rob, what is the answer to how many gallons of milk in a 80-pound wheel of compost? Well, the good thing is that they didn't go over. It's actually 140. 140. 140. Okay. This incredible, explains, right? That's incredible. That's mm -hmm. a lot of cows. So you said that's 30 cows will make that in amount a day. in one day. And Imagine this, people. For one wheel of cheese, 
It explains why cheese is so expensive. Right. A little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah, because that's crazy. That's a lot of animals to feed, a lot of animals to milk. And that's that's that's, that's an estimation I mean, because the yeah. heart the the longer a cheese is aged, the 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 lighter it will get. It will lose weight as it ages, so that affects it as well. Um, so these are kind of general numbers. Right. Uh, Comté is from a region called French Comté, and it's um, it's made in a little place called the Jura Mountains, which is in the region of French Comté. And like I said, they're huge wheels. They're always cow's milk, and um, they um, it's it's the most uh, popular cheese in terms of volume that comes out of France, and um, it's been made for for centuries. It's most of it comes from the milk of Montbelliard cows, which is a really sweet uh, milk, and it also um, it's it's greatly affected by the terroir or the the um, uh, the vegetation from the, from the Alps. So the cows march up and they eat uh, these amazing spring and summer grasses and wildflowers, and uh, it's very seasonal. That's the best time um, to, to get this cheese is milk that comes from the spring and summer. And then during the winter, they actually feed the cows hay from, um, from the summer uh, grasses. Okay. So the Conte on your plates, everybody, um, will probably be the more pale yellow piece. Okay, not, uh, I know two cheeses were really similar in style and color, but it's kind of a golden mm -hmm. yellow, light yellow color, and it's going to have less, it's going to be a little less firm and crunchy than the other piece that might be on your plate. So sorry, our labeling technique might not have been quite <laughs> perfect, but taste the harder one, but not the hardest cheese. That's the Conte on the plate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Conte and... Uh, if you ever, if you're ever looking for a sub for Comte, there's a cheese called Beaufort, which is from. It's also from uh, the French Alps. It's a little bit from a little bit south of Comte in a place called Savoie. Um, but the this family of cheeses are typically made at elevation. Uh, well, sometimes they're referred to as Alpine or Alpage uh, cheeses. They're cow's milk. Um, as noted, they're made in these huge, ginormous wheels. Beaufort can be. 150 pound wheels. The white cheese with the holes in it is called Emmental, and those are sometimes 200 pound wheels. They're huge, 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 um, and that's due to just the remoteness of where they uh, of where they're they're made. Um, so they're firmer and, ma and made in these huge wheels. Uh, I should also mention these are they're they're always made in a in a cooperative um, cheese at a cooperative cheese making uh, facility, and that means that the cheese makers are buying milk from an average of like 20 farmers and so each of the 20 farmers has like 100 cows um, so there is lots and lots of milk and they and they definitely know what to do with it mm -hmm. what do we think of the pairing oh <laughs> i'm still eating it's so good <laughs> and I, about the pairing i should also say i i feel like comte and the, all these types of cheeses these alpines they're so flexible they're so versatile that they do well with both white and red but also beer yeah, and whiskeys. I mean, there's there's so much, and you can cook with them. Yeah, alpines. You everyone is alpines. What do we mean when we say alpine? Probably the best way to describe it are the Swiss cheeses. The Swiss style cheeses are the alpines. They're the big format wheels. They're the eighty pounders. Yeah, the but not all from Switzerland. Pounders. Not all from Switzerland, right? What you're having today happens to be from France, but it's from the mountainous region of France. Uh, and you're right. The alpines. I mean. The cows are eating amazing grasses and flowers all summer long, right, to, to create this delicious milk. And um, these cheeses are diverse, complex, and they do go swing both ways. <laughs> Red swing and white. both ways. Well, you're talking about um, cheese, right? Oh, wait. <laughs> the cheese swings both ways. Red and white, um, <laughs> super, super delicious. Some other examples, yeah. Fontina, which yeah. is from Northern Italy. Okay. We're going to talk about Northern Italy in a yes. second. Alp Blossom, um, Austria. Alp Blossom. What about Germany? Uh, there's one. There's one from Bavaria called Alex that we carry. That's incredible. It's named for a train that goes through um, southern Germany. There's there's some from like you said Austria. Mm -hmm. um, gosh. Yeah. Uh, what are some other? I mean, tons from Switzerland. Appenzeller. Yes. Um, Emmentaler. Yeah. Of course, Gruyere. Uh, the, the classic uh, Alpines. And they're great yeah. for they're great for cooking too. So if you're ever um, doing a fondue, it's always a, it's one of or a collection of these types of cheeses. If you ever want to do a fancy mac and cheese, boom. Yeah, boom, bam. They just melt so well. They're so flavorful. Take and, your 30 yeah. cent box of Sara Lee and then throw in some Gruyere and it'll kick it up a notch, as Emil says. <laughs> um, 
Okay, now you've lost the train. I've really <laughs> lost the train has left the building. But Alpine's very, very good. Awesome. Okay. So, All right. So oh, shall we? can we say again though? Um, when you're doing fondue yeah. and you're getting the recipe, you know, they'll always say Gruyere Emmentaler, yeah. but feel free to venture into the other ones. They yeah. all work and they're all delicious. Yeah. So do a meld of them because it's really good. And then throw in something funky to make it your yeah. own, like a blue or like a truffle cheese or a goat cheese, whatever. Anything. Whatever. Yeah. So now let's jump to reds, Robbie G, please. Yeah. But so the red, oh, I shouldn't show that bottle, but the, the um, if you have a Nebbiolo at home, that's what we chose for our tasting. Uh, Nebbiolo is the name of the varietal, it's the name of the grape, and uh, they're, they're really known to come from northern Italy, the re region of Piedmont and Lombardy, and uh, to name another famous uh, region or place or town in, in Europe, Barolo is the name of probably the most famous Nebbiolo region, and uh, to take that name Barolo, if, that's, if that name is on the bottle, it means it's 100% Nebbiolo, always. And there's some of the, I mean, an Italian, especially a Northern Italian will tell you from their quarantine, it's the best um, <laughs> wine out there. But that's the same way that somebody from Southern France will tell you that the best cheese is Roquefort. Somebody from Spain will tell you that the best cheese is Manchego. And from uh, California, <laughs> best we'll cheese is Fog. <laughs> uh, so Nebbiolos tend to be kind of uh, bigger bodied. You get notes generally of, uh, of red berry, violet, and uh, they're really fun to pair, but we're kind of stepping up here. And so we're, um, we're gonna go with a couple of regional pairings and that both of the cheeses are from Northern Italy. The next one is called Robiola Bocina. And this is it, this is a bigger piece of it. You can see yours is a bit more runny. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's a ripe piece of it for sure. They come in about eight ounce or that's a half a pound piece and they're, they're square shaped. Robiolas are a, a general type of uh, cheese. They're, they're, it's unclear the origin of the name. It could be that it originated in a town called Robio, which is in the province of, uh, of uh, Pavia. My family comes from Robio. Rob? Ro oh, God. The, um, sorry, okay. Where's the... <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> okay. the, uh, it, 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 the name also can come from um, the fact that the, the rind turns kind of a reddish or ruddy color as it ages, so it's not, they're not sure why they're called Robiolas, but uh, they were originally 100% goat's milk cheeses, and now they can be goat, sheep, cow, or mixed milk. This one, the Robiola Bocina, and Bocina is the name of a town in Piedmont, and that's a common theme here. Uh, this one is a mix of sheep and cow's milk, and it is super right, right now here's our sheep. <laughs> It's a California sheep, and uh, so it's but it's fairly young. It kind of looks like a brie. If there's any confusion as to what, which one it is on your plate, yeah, definitely looks like a brie. Mm -hmm. And you can eat the rind. Questions come up. Can I eat the rind? Absolutely, eat the rind. Yeah, only. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's up to you though. I would mm -hmm. say there, it's there's no right or wrong. If you don't, if you think the rind tastes weird or looks weird or smells weird or the texture is weird, yeah. do not eat it. But it is edible. It's edible. But don't eat it if, you, if you're not into it. Never eat anything you don't like. <laughs> that's right. Unless you're a kid and your parents tell you to. <laughs> um, so that's the Robiola. I don't think I have any more. Yeah, it's really good. Facts. But uh, one of the, the reasons we picked it, right, with the Nebbiolo wrap yeah. was the whole terroir and yeah. just Italy with Italy and getting region mm -hmm. to region, right? Yeah, so we wanted to do a, a regional pairing. And uh, so that's, I think I mentioned from a region called Piedmont, Piemonte, and that just means foot, P, foot. Uh, mont mountain so it's the foot of the mountain as you're going up into the alps and um, there's a little tiny region almost within piedmont and then it's it borders switzerland which is called val d'aosta and that's where fontine is made and that's what we were talking about earlier but uh, robiolas come from up there there's a there's a really traditional cheese called castle Manuel that comes oh, from yeah. there and it has like this really kind of scary crusty looking rind you don't see it a lot here in the states no we need to get that back it crumbles mm -hmm. it looks like a crumbly castle wall I oh, mean, yeah. honestly that'd be the best description that <laughs> that, I could that's tell a of it. very good description I remember that no, it <laughs> hopefully it doesn't taste like a castle wall it kind of does <laughs> not that i've licked a castle wall but yeah. it seems that it would be like that yeah. there um some other notable cheeses from not all from piedmont but from lombardy Gorgonzola is a famous blue cheese that's from outside of Milan, uh, which is in Lombardy. Um, they, there's a lot of what they call stracchino cheeses, and that means that it kind of comes from the word for tired, and it, it refers to tired cows, so they march down from the, they, they march <laughs> down from the Alps, and they get milked, and they make this, they give this really rich milk that makes this really, really flavorful cheese, and those are stracchino, that's the stracchino family of cheeses. Yeah. yeah. 
So I, 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 wouldn't it be another fun idea, Rob, if you're ever hosting a party, or, mm -hmm. you know, get a cheese from Northern Italy and then get a wine from Northern yeah. Italy. And then that just th naturally goes together. You get the taste and the, the terroir. You just get all those flavors that are from that region and put them together so that works. Here's a, right? you can use, there's so many, it's endless, the, the themes and the ideas that you can do. Another fun one that we do here sometimes, and maybe we'll do this as an, another virtual, is we do old world versus new world. And we'll take the classic and then we'll compare it to um, a, a California uh, version of that same style of cheese. Um, because really, every all the classics are made here in the States and believe it or not, they're made very, very well. Yep, for sure, for sure. Okay, so awesome. we're ready for the last The cheese. last one, I don't want it to end, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can, we can answer questions, we can hang out all yeah, night. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, so the last cheese is called Piave. And uh, we have a Piave Vecchia, which means it's an aged Piave. So Piave is kind of like the, um, the term of that, uh, of, of, for that cheese, and they can be aged, medium aged, extra aged, very, very, very aged. Um, they can be anywhere from a couple of months, which is going to be milder, because the cheese really gets all of its character with age. They can be aged for a year or so, and the Piave Vecchio that we have is about a year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we have an ex we had an extra aged version up in Del Mar, which is called Sapor del Piave, mm -hmm. and they're named for the Piave River and the Piave River Valley. They're always cow's milk, but that's where the animals are grazing, and it's um, that's located in the region of Veneto, and you may know Veneto from the city of Venice, the same city of Venice. Yes. And um, I, would, I would say these are most similar to, 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 to compare to something that we know. Asiago is one that you see or that I used to see in, in groceries as, as a kid. There's another one from up there called Montazio. Yeah. They're aged, usually very hard cow's milk cheeses. Um, but this is a Piave Vecchio. And usually it, it's a good sub for a Parmigiano Reggiano. It's um, just, of course, from a different region. Um, but really good with the with the bigger, more robust reds like the yeah. Oh, it totally is. Rob, I get it. this one to me is super crunchy. If everybody gets it, mm -hmm. so um, the piave on your plate is the hardest one that was on your plate. Some of you, probably most of you, got it cut into kind of like a little spear shape, mm -hmm. a little twig. I don't know. I guess I would call it a uh, rectangle. Um, but it's the crunchiest of the bunch. Yeah. Rob, it is so good. And it actually goes with the white too. Yeah. White wines great with cheese because they're so crisp and they cut through the creaminess and everything of it but this one's super crunchy because that's the aging of it the strabecchio the aging gives it that nice crunch um i love this yeah I, and you're right that almost not better than a parm but to me it's almost pineapple-y it's fruitier than a parm it gets we, the, yeah. it's very strange how it gets a kind of fruity or almost like tropical notes mm -hmm. at a certain age um, and it's really fun when pairing to try try different things with the same beverage and just see how they, they react differently and how they act differently. Um, you know, I always mention the different types of pairings and there's no such thing as right or wrong, but it's all about just playing around. We, um, we talk about complementary and contrasting in terms of flavor. So, you know, contrasting are opposites that balance out complementary or similar flavors that come together. There's textural pairing and then there's regional pairing and regional pairing is playing off of that concept of terroir the earth that the that these agricultural food product products come from and um so but a parent can hit on one of or all of all those types uh, and, and there's no rules the yeah. only rule is to have fun no rules to have fun i'm getting a lot of comments that people love crunchy oh yeah <laughs> Other oh, crunchies. I mean, what's making the crunchies? Like, show the crunchies. You know what? I mean, it's what funny. are the crunchies? We had this. Uh, this this is just a piece that we had for show and tell. This is called OG Crystal, and it's from Belgium, and it is a Gouda style cheese. And show that. Oh, the, that writing up there. Do you want to read it, Gina? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what are cheese crystals? Most of the time, these crunchy crystals in cheeses, like aged Goudas, Alpines, Parmigiano, Piave Vecchio, are amino acids aka the building blocks of proteins, and they're called tyrosine. And you can see the little diagram of that for the scientists out there. And that's what makes crunchies in cheese. And crunchies are the best. That gives a texture, flavor. Mm. I mean, how fun it is, was it, to go from the bocina, that's so creamy and velvety, to this, this crunchy texture, mm. which is, uh, yeah. wow, it's just so good, yeah. Crun if you're looking for crunchies, the aged goudas are incredible. This one is great, OG Crystal, but any of the aged Goudas are great.
the aged Alpines, the Parmigiano Reggiano, and other aged Italian cheeses like the Piave Vecchio, Support El Piave. Um, they, with at, at a year and a half or so, they start get, getting the crunchies, and then they just get crunchier and crunchier over time. It's um, we we used to I used to hear people say salt crystals, and it's not that's not really accurate. It's really amino acids, but there's salt in there. There's lots of salt in cheese. And uh, so if you like that texture, come into the shop or call, I should say, and, uh, and let us know that you really like the amino acids. You like the tyrosine crunch. The tyrosine. Yeah, you use the word tyrosine, we'll know that you're, you've been to this class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really good. Okay. That'll be on the test later. And Okay, not a test, but for anyone that can give feedback, I want to get a vote, if uh -huh. we could. Did we like the red wine better or the white wine? That's vote number one. And then I want to know what was the favorite cheese. Mm -hmm. So if you can jump onto your computer or your phone, however you're watching, and give us the vote, red and your or white, and your favorite of the four. I'd just be curious which one won. Yeah, and yeah. This, so this is, this is virtual tasting number two. We're going to continue doing this series. And then you, and you can watch them later on as well. So you can watch them again and get caught up, and take notes if you'd like. But we're going to continue doing this. So stay tuned for the next uh, virtual uh, pairing as well. Whenever that will be, we'll figure it out. Yes. I think, I, wow. <laughs> okay. <Yes. laughs> um, it's going to be something, Rob, next week. And it might be a cooking with cheese class. Yeah. It will be a cooking with cheese class. I like it. Um, so... Through all the channels, we will send out the information about the class, but next Sunday is Easter, mm -hmm. so we actually won't be here for Easter. We'll be here before Easter, but there will be some sort of virtual tasting then. So, I'm getting some votes here. Oh, we've got red. Oh, Seltzer Share. Oh, Seltzer Share. Yeah. <laughs> red and, oh, Tyrosine Surprise. Is Seltzer Share winning? White wine, well, red was overpowering, uh -huh. which, you know, so can, can happen. Yeah. We've got a vote from Jason, red and the Conte. White in the triangle. I've got a lot, I gotta say, so far, the whites and the seltzer share mm -hmm. or the Bermuda Triangle is in the lead. Ooh, a top oh and Italian Red's jumping ahead. Okay. I would yeah. tell you, you know, See, isn't this funny that there's such opinions of the best ones? And you said I mean and the best is their favorite. And you yeah. said but you said at the beginning, if there's a home run, if you had one pairing to go for, a safe pick would be the Sauvignon Blanc and one of these types of goat cheeses. Yep. And, um, and these types of goat cheeses really are the benchmark. Um, the, the Loire Valley goat's milk cheeses, that's, that's where it all yeah. started. So yeah. you can always, uh, if, I mean, if we don't have a seltzer share, we'll have something in that family and probably a half a dozen things in that family. Exactly. That's, yeah, that's another thing. You can always go with the same family. It doesn't yeah. have to be these specific cheeses uh, by any means that we did. It's in that family. Just that because your good. recipe from Barefoot Contessa or whoever says to use a specific cheese, we can find something to replace it. And that's kind of the fun of it, too, is to play around. Wow, everybody. I can't even go through this. <laughs> Jay, Hillary, Devin, Melissa, Chris, chemistry. I love that chemistry community. Ooh, you would have loved the tyrosine chemistry community. Jay, Carol, Megan. Oh, my gosh. We got such votes. Conte in the... Last cheese, the Piave Bermuda Triangle was the best standalone. Oh, my God. These votes are so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Um, yeah. I don't know what to say. This has been such fun feedback, Rob. Um, thank you all for joining and just buying these plates and supporting us through yeah. this time. We're going to try to make these even more just fun and educational as we go. Um, you can always send more questions to Professor McCheese, which is really easy. Rob at Venissimo.com. That's R-O-B. <laughs> ROV at Benissimo.com if you have any other questions. As in Robiola. I'm going to go through all this list here on YouTube and try to answer back to anybody that had one. Uh, Rudy, John Berger, and Martin Bader, you get in touch with Rob at Benissimo.com. We're going to get your cleavers for you for answering so quickly on the question. And oh my gosh, anything else, Rob, that you want to add? Just thank you so much for the support. And, yeah. Uh, we Benissimo look forward to seeing you. you again. Yeah. yeah, we love you guys. Yeah, thank you for tuning in. We're going to sign off, and we're going to say, see you next week, au revoir tonight, yes. and arrivederci. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Bye. Bye.